Today's lecture is on the metropolis and the mental life, an essay by the sociologist Georg Zimmel during sociology's early years as a discipline. This lecture is an example of sociology's fundamental theorem, that our social contexts influence human society and behaviors, including us as individuals. And so this essay was about how changing environments, from living in rural environments to urban ones, can impact us individually. One of the big differences between urban and rural life is the rapidity with which things change around us. Zimmel called it a telescoping of changing images, pronounced differences within what is grasped at a single glance in the unexpectedness of violent stimuli. Basically, what we perceive with our senses, what we see and hear and smell and experience, all change swiftly and constantly in the metropolis. But why should that matter? Zimmel argues that being bombarded with so much and so often requires much more mental energy to process. In contrast, in a rural setting, things change slowly and slightly, if at all, and so we get accustomed to our surroundings and habits, and this demands far less of us mentally. So if things change rapidly in an urban setting, and the oversupply of rapidly changing stimuli to our senses requires much more mental energy to process, what is the impact on us? First of all, Zimmel argues that engaging emotionally to all that stimuli would be overwhelming. And people in urban environments build something of a protective organ to protect themselves from being mentally and emotionally overwhelmed. Instead of responding to all this stimuli with their full emotions, there is a certain emotional distancing that happens in which people react to all these things in a very rational, logical and dispassionate way. What does dealing with people in a rational way entail? Well, one way is to deal with people and things in a very calculative way. We essentially deal with people just as we do with numbers. For instance, when we define value in terms of cost, or when employers or landlords determine a person's value to some degree by their credit score, or when, at least at one point in time, online dating services were giving us percentages to let us know how much we supposedly matched with everyone else on the platform. In fact, urban life is characterized by calculability at its most basic level, by the clock. In order for any city to be able to organize and coordinate its tens of thousands of people and supply chains and production processes and activities all going on all at the same time, it has to rely on precision and punctuality, without which city life would very quickly descend into chaos. And so individual people have to live by the clock in order to keep their jobs and appointments and live a functional life in the city. The third effect identified by Zimmel is the blasé attitude, which is basically an indifference that people in cities develop towards the excess number of things and people and events going on around them all the time. Once again, this effect is an outcome of that overstimulation to our senses that, according to Zimmel, just utterly tires out our reserves and our ability to react. The effect ultimately is that we don't react, or we stopped reacting meaningfully to things. Now, at the time Zimmel was writing, he was most likely thinking of how people in cities ignore the multitudes of people they pass by every day on the way to work, just because paying attention to everyone they see would be impossible. He was also likely thinking of the products on sale. It might be a little difficult to imagine what was on sale at Zimmel's time, so let's look at a more contemporary option. When we have three options, say of something like shampoo, it is reasonable to properly evaluate each one to decide which one is likely the best for us. But when you have 30 options, as the picture shows, most of us are not going to bother. Now Zimmel was writing in the early 1900s. One might ask if today's digital world is just as much a metropolis in the same sense. For instance, with the availability of streaming platforms like Netflix, Hulu, Disney+, and HBO Max, we have thousands of options at our fingertips. On social media, we are bombarded with thousands of articles, videos, memes, and updates on an hourly basis to the point that we find ourselves scrolling past dozens if not hundreds of things without a second thought. I still distinctly remember this one time when I was on one of the social media platforms, I won't say which because It'll make me sound old. But I remember that one of the first things I saw in my newsfeed one day was an article about a terrorist attack that had left dozens dead. And the very next featured article below it was about how hamsters should rule the world. 
the dissonance between the two issues was so strikingly different that if I had actually been in a state to engage emotionally with both, I would have been crying at the first, laughing at the second, and then probably having a mental breakdown right after. The fact that I didn't, and most people don't, shows just how good we have all become at numbing ourselves to the excessive number of things that we face, if not in the physical metropolis, then in the online one. A fourth effect of living in the metropolis, whether literally or figuratively, such as in the sense of our modern digitally connected society today, is what can be broadly summarized as individualism. There are at least two senses to my use of the term individualism. In one sense, it can create a sense of loneliness, which at first glance seems counterintuitive. How can one be lonely in an environment in which one is surrounded by people? The answer to Zimmel lies in all the effects we have discussed before. Although we may be surrounded by throngs of people, recall that we do not engage with the vast majority of them. One might further argue that not only do we have few, if any, meaningful interactions with the vast majority of people in a metropolis, but perhaps that paradox of being surrounded by people with no one to really talk to in any meaningful way amplifies that sense of loneliness. Besides loneliness, we can also think of individualism in terms of how we present ourselves to others. Simmel argues that because people in urban settings deal with their surrounding environment in calculable ways, emphasizing quantity over quality, it ultimately levels us as individuals. This is a slight exaggeration, but if everyone is evaluated based on numerical metrics, then we all essentially become rather one-dimensional, not only to others, but even to ourselves. And so to stand out to others and ourselves in a quantitatively driven world, Simmel argues that we strive for ways to make ourselves qualitatively different. But the ways in which we do so aren't necessarily because we find particular value in those ways by which we make ourselves unique, but simply for the sake of being different. As Zimmel argues, it's not the content of such activity that is meaningful to us, but simply the goal of being different. If that notion sounds glum, just wait, there's more. Zimmel suggests that what therefore ends up happening is that even as the culture of city life develops what might be called objective culture, it comes at the cost of the development of ourselves as individuals, what might be called subjective culture. Our individual subjective culture atrophies or wastes away, Simmel says, while the objective culture of society experiences hypertrophy and expansion, in other words. And so we lose the opportunity to develop ourselves as individuals. In fact, we lose control over how our culture develops as if it had a mind of its own. We become, Zimmel says, like cogs in a machine with little agency over our culture. In this lecture, we have discussed Zimmel's take on the metropolis and how it has created mental changes in the individuals who live in it. We first introduce the key distinction between urban and rural life, which is the surplus of rapidly changing stimuli people experience in the former that they don't in the latter, at least not to the same degree. We then discuss a range of outcomes of being bombarded with all that stimuli. We start engaging in our environment in more rationalized and intellectualized and emotional ways, assessing things around us in more quantitative or calculable ways than qualitative ways. This change in mental attitude then creates a blasé attitude towards the things around us. Perhaps partly as a result of that, we experience a heightened individualism in two senses of the word. We experience more loneliness in the crowds, and to help us feel distinct and unique, we grow a bit more eccentric. But these efforts to make ourselves distinct aren't necessarily done because we find meaning in the nature of those differences, but rather just because they are different. In doing so, Zimmel feels that we end up both losing some level of control over the development of our culture, while becoming stunted in our development as individuals.